message before. Okay, so let, let's uh, get on with chemical analysis. And I'd, again, I'd, some of this I'll move quite quickly through. Um, we analyse soils for a, a bunch of different reasons, um, largely to uh, understand what's going on, um, but also because we're interested in ideas of fertility and things like that, or how good the soil is for growing things, or conversely, how bad it is for growing things, risk of toxicity and so on. So uh, unfortunately um, for you guys, I guess there's a, quite a bewildering array of different types and, and uh, methods for soil chemical analysis, even for the same thing. Um, so what I will hope to do is try and to unpick that and I hope that we can make sense of it in terms of some of the, the places we've been already this morning in terms of understanding the, the types of processes and forms of things that we analyse for in soils. So just a pointer to I, I guess the current Australian Bible of um, soil analysis, this book by uh, Raymond and Lyons. We uh, use a lot of ad at least adaptations of a lot of the methods in there for methods in the labs that we um, run with you guys including what we're doing uh, this afternoon. Um, more specialised stuff, of course, like the um, DNA analysis that Deirdre is going to run you through with, that's not in any textbook, so not that I know of anyway. All right, so the, the types of chemical analyses that we do, um, first of all, you you'd be very familiar with analysing the basic chemical properties of soils, probably. Um, uh, if not, the typical things that we do are the, some of the things that you, we got you to measure in the field. So electrical conductivity of a soil suspension, giving us an idea of salinity in soils. Uh, pH, of course, and we've made the case this morning for measuring pH on everything because it's so important chemically. We measure organic matter or organic carbon content um, for much the same reasons as it controls a lot of chemical processes. Um, Sometimes we measure things like pH buffering and acid production potential in particular environments, particularly acid sulphate soils. So some of these basic properties are, uh, have a specific application, some are very, very generally applicable, like the, your pH and organic matter and EC measurements. Now the, the other types of things that we do in terms of, of uh, chemical analysis are measuring the total amount of, and I, I've said elemental analysis because that's what I'm familiar with, but it, it could also be specific compounds as well. So people who analyse for um, hydrocarbon contamination, for example, may measure total hydrocarbons as a, an indicator of something. Um, certainly gives you an indicator of the amount of contamination, but not always its effect. So as we've seen with some of the data that we've looked at already, the total amount of let's say uh, a, a metal in soils, doesn't inform us about bioavailability. So really it's uh, the type of analysis that we could do needs to be targeted towards the type of information that we want. Now we've also seen how partial or, or somewhat selective elemental analyses might give us a bit more information because they're either intended to represent a species, for example we might e try to extract only the iron exchangeable forms of an element from a soil um, using a particular type of solution, shaking it up, analysing the solution, or some uh, functional analysis like a bioavailable or mobile fraction. Um, and that's pretty much what uh, a lot of soil fertility analysis does. It, it tries to address the amount of bioavailable element phosphorus or nitrogen or potassium or whatever in a soil system. All right, now total elemental analyses, I'll, I'll deal with these uh, a bit. The, the gold standard method is something called X-ray fluorescence. So if we prepare a soil sample in the right way, usually uh, in our lab by fusing it, um, melting it with a flux so that we've got a homogeneous bead of something and we, we um, fire a, an X-ray at that and what the x-ray does is excite the atoms and they go to a kind of different electronic state and then decay back and that re results in the emission of x-rays of slightly lower wavelength. And the beauty of that is that those emitted x-rays come out at wavelengths which are diagnostic of each element. And there's uh, no um, form of an element which escapes that, you know, they're, they're just treated as, 
as atoms. So we get a, a very, very good major analysis, but it's not incredibly sensitive. It doesn't deal well with most trace elements. So in that case, we usually move to another type of technique for elemental analysis, and that usually involves trying to dissolve the sample completely. Now, there are a couple of ways that we can do that. The traditional method is to use uh, hydrofluoric acid, which is the only strong acid able to dissolve silicate minerals. The problem is with hydrofluoric acid is it's extremely toxic. Um, if you get it on your body, naked skin, um, without quick, very, very quick action, you will probably die. Um, and that this has happened, oh, serious. Um, there was a case, when I first arrived in Perth in the 90s, there was a case that, that the mining industry was cranking along quite well. So there were a few backyard labs doing elemental analysis. Somebody spilt a little bit of hydrofluoric acid, you know, just a few mils on their leg. I thought, oh, here we go. So they jumped into their swimming pool. Not enough. There's this, there is a particular antidote to it, um, calcium gluconate, I think. And if you get that on quickly and enough, it, it may work. But the problem is with HF, it, you know, it dissolves everything and it starts dissolving into your bones. And yeah, you don't want to go there. So we don't use it in our labs at UWA. It's just too hazardous. We use it, uh, th there is a specific... Um, discipline that really needs it and that's uh, palynology where people uh, need to dissolve silicates away to, to resolve pollen grains and things because HF won't dissolve organics um, but they they take unbelievable precautions using this stuff so our preferred method is slightly less hazardous we use the same technique as preparing samples for x-ray fluorescence we mix up a little bit of soil or sediment or rock with some flux usually a boron based flux melt it at a thousand degrees or so so as i said slightly less hazardous um, cool it down we've got a little looks like a one of those ornamental glass pebbles that you can buy at Bunnings. Um, we can dissolve that quite easily in relatively dilute acid and that gives us the complete method. And that we've actually tested this and it gives results very, very similar to X-ray fluorescence for most elements. So that's that's our preferred technique. So there's there's a bunch of things like that. And it total analysis is really important for a lot of applications. We can't do without it. Um, and certainly we we just looked at the um, uh, that study by Smolders at all and that their um, analysis that they needed to use was total element as a proportion of uh, effective cation exchange capacity. So they would need to use a technique like this in order to estimate bioavailability, for example. And what's what's often used as kind of a, a semi-quantitative analysis, and something that we use a lot is aquaregia digestion. So aquaregia is you know the the royal acid, if you like, aquaregia literally water royal um, because it can dissolve gold. Um, now that's got particular properties that allow it to do that and it actually won't dissolve a whole raft of other minerals including most silicates and soils so it's a really convenient analysis it works quite well for some things but it's it's uh, effectively a a strong partial analysis with all of these you need something you generate a solution right so you dissolve in strong acids or you fuse and then dissolve or you dissolve in slightly weaker acids um, you, you still end up with a solution so you need some sort of machine to uh, analyze them. In the old days it was something called atomic absorption spectroscopy where you had one element at a time that you could run then you changed a lamp on the machine and then ran another element and so on and so you can imagine that determining 20 or so elements by that got pretty tedious. Um, it wasn't long until people invented um, uh, these techniques uh, prefixed ICP for inductively coupled plasma now these are pretty cool. Um, basically, we run a stream of argon through an electromagnetic induction coil, which heats the argon to about 10,000 degrees. So we've got this plasma stream in which we inject our sample. Now, again, the energy from that makes the atoms excited. And in this case, it's a different sort of excitement. They don't emit x-rays. They emit light, which is in the UV visible range. And again, the wavelength is for ICP optical emission spectroscopy, that's the one I'm talking about at the moment, the wavelength is specific to each element. So, and that's the type of analysis that will run your samples that you generate today, um, ICP OER. So we can simultaneously measure the concentrations of um, about 40 or 50 elements at, that's reliable for. It's not as sensitive as its related technique, ICP-MS, where 
we still inject into an argon plasma, but the detector is a mass spectrometer, basically, where we can discriminate elements by their mass. Every atom has a different mass, right? So we can um, we have a, a mass detector that's it runs through a series of magnets, uh, the simplest one called a quadrupole, and we get a different signal related to different masses. Okay, so they're, they're very, very powerful techniques, both of them. ICP-MS in particular can analyze basically the whole periodic table down to parts per billion sensitivity. So that it's pretty good if you've got one of those around. Carbon and nitrogen, which are pretty important elements uh, biologically, we use slightly different techniques. Uh, in fact, the ICP techniques don't handle them well at all because they're more uh, sensitive for heavier atoms. The carbon and nitrogen we use slightly different techniques. Often it's just burning the sample and analysing the gas that comes off under obviously very controlled conditions. And there are other fancy techniques as well. There's, there was one that um, when the Lucas Heights nuclear reactor was operating, um, uh, you could irradiate your sample with neutrons. This is called instrumental neutron activation analysis. And then count the, uh, the radioactivity that's given off. And again, it gave you a very sensitive but expensive um, elemental analysis. Okay. Now, most often we don't do that sort of thing. Um, we're interested in targeting a specific type or form of an element in soils. And so we're interested in, I guess, two of the, the main planks of analytical chemistry. Is our analysis selective enough? And is it quantitative enough? So by selectivity, are we getting only the form that we want and nothing else? Right? And that's something, if you do an analytical chemistry course, I'm, I'm a chemistry major from too long ago, before most of you guys were born, um, that's something they drummed into us. Is your technique selective? Is it quantitative? So if you are targeting a certain phase, are you getting all of it, right? Um, or only some of it? Um, so those are some things to bear in mind. So if, if for example, we wanted to analyze in soils just the bioavailable fraction, is there any overlap with non-bioavailable? And if we're targeting the bioavailable fraction, are we getting all of it or just some of it? And how much of some? If it's only a proportion, how do we know that our results mean anything in the first place? All right. Now, there are some ways around that, obviously, and we'll, we'll go through those as we go, but those are things to bear in mind. First of all, we need to remind ourselves of, of what the forms are uh, of elements and soils. We've got, of course, our unweathered primary minerals, which can contain most of the periodic table, generally not, but um, uh, except nitrogen. There are only a few uh, primary minerals which contain nitrogen and they're restricted to a few unusual volcanic deposits around the place, so we can usually ignore that. We know that soil organic matter can contain some particularly biologically important elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur all exist in organic forms. Um, we know about exchangeable already, we've just discussed those and the reason why they're exchangeable is because they exist as cations and it's because of higher concentrations, it's these types of cations, the major element cations, that are that's a dominant mechanism for. And we've looked at different sorts of fixation. Um, so for phosphorus and sulfur and aluminium and most of the trace elements, these types of mechanisms were either some form of adsorption, strong bonding adsorption, or forming new minerals are important. And finally, we know um, or we suspect that s small concentrations of just about every element will be present in the water in the system as well. That just about covers it. Okay, we normally for inorganic chemical analysis, we can ignore the gas phase, although that's obviously not true for carbon and nitrogen. So we talk to somebody like Dr. Louise Barton about this, she'll say trace gases are enormously important. We need to know about nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide and so on. But I tend to ignore those, all right? So basic chemical properties, are the, uh, you've, you've all um, done this probably and measured these, uh, so I won't spend too much on those. Um, total elemental analyses, as we've seen, so again, I'll just flick through this, that sometimes they're useful. For example, total carbon is a useful parameter to know because it does tell us something about the properties of our soil system. However, um, total amounts of other elements uh, don't necessarily give us all the information that we want. So, uh, for example, if you're an exploration geochemist, the total amount of gold in a soil is often not the best way to go um, because it doesn't 
show what's been mobilized from an, an ore body, for example. Or toxicity, as we've seen, very seldom relates to total metal concentrations unless we can modify that information somehow. Okay, so how do we do it? Um, and most of what we do and what we do in the lab this afternoon is what we I will call a, a partial or selective analysis. Um, and we're, we're using a technique called DTPA extraction of soils. It uses a complexing agent to extract a fraction of metals which is supposed to be related to bioavailability for some soil environments um, and it leaves the rest behind. So some t there, are, there are different techniques for different purposes. If you're interested in pedology, for example, soil formation, um, the newly precipitated iron oxides may be a very important material to analyze because it, it it's one of the processes which is important in soil formation so we target that deliberately there's a, a reagent called tams reagent um, acid ammonium oxalate which we use to dissolve amorphous iron and aluminium oxides and that's important if you're interested in, in pedology or soil formation if you're interested in um, bioavailability plant nutrition for example we've got the bicarbonate extract which is good for potassium uh, and phosphorus, for example, um, the Colwell or Olsen phosphorus test. Um, in other contexts, there are partial leaches for metals, um, leaching procedures and so forth. Um, and just for completeness, there are these things called, which you may come across in literature called sequential extraction techniques. So these were developed um, in the late 70s for, whoops, for sediments. Um, when researchers were interested in what, what are the forms of elements uh, that we find in sediments and the way they decided would be a good way to do it is to first of all react their sediment or soil or whatever with a fairly weak solution in this case magnesium nitrate solution just an, a neutral electrolyte which extracted the exchangeable form and then an oxidizing agent which broke down the organic matter or some sort of complexing agent and in al under alkaline conditions dissolve the organic matter and freed it from the metal ions which made it insoluble. Then a, a reducing agent and that dissolved um, manganese oxides which are very prone to being chemically reduced. Then our acid oxalate re reagent and progressively stronger until we got to the final step where you dissolve the res residual minerals. Now that at each stage we're doing a partial extraction which depends on the previous extraction of um, another phase which would otherwise overlap and so there, there's a lot of these around there's probably a hundred different sequential extractions which are all designed roughly to give um, information on the forms of an element in the soils but they're never ever used except for research purposes um, they would never be used for example to measure bioavailability um, not as their primary objective anyway although it's often deduced from the amount of element in the weaker extractions all right, so uh, here's some examples, the very simple ones. If we want to measure immediately bioavailable or bioaccessible nitrogen in soils, we get our soil usually fresh, not oven dried, because that can change things a little bit, and we shake it up with a two molar KCl solution. Um, the excess of potassium cations displaces ammonium from cation exchange sites, and the chloride uh, makes sure that the extraction of nitrate is quantitative, um, and it's only targeting particular chemical fractions, exchangeable or water soluble, or so we think. Um, so we don't extract any organic matter and the nitrogen associated with that, and we don't extract what we call fixed ammonium that's in the structure of things like vermiculite clays. Um, so what it does is gives you a, a single point in time snapshot of nitrogen availability to plants. Um, and in the longer term, so that's our measure of bioavailability, if we want to measure bioaccessibility, we start to have to measure the organic material which is easily broken down. So soil biologists use an incubation technique. So they basically let some soil sit for a while. They may add some food for the bacteria and fungi um, so that they're more active and then measure before and after nitrate and ammonium by the same technique. Right, so that's an example. Another very common one is the, the Colwell or Olsen phosphorus. So we use a dilute, um, slightly alkaline solution of bicarbonate. It's got a low concentration of hydroxide, and we know that hydroxide is competitive with phosphate for adsorption on soil minerals. Um, 
and so it displaces that weakly adsorbed phosphate out into the solution where we can measure it and there's a number of techniques for measurement of phosphorus in a solution. ICP, but that's usually too expensive for a single element analysis so we tend to use just a colour technique which a lot of you have probably encountered at one stage or another, um, the molybdenum blue technique for example. And there are a whole lot of forms of phosphorus that we don't think are addressed by that technique, right? Uh, organic or precipitated or it's very strongly adsorbed phosphorus, right? And so it's based on that type of reaction and the, the observation that um, the phosphate adsorption shown by the, the open circles here decreases as we increase the pH. So the extractant about pH 8.5 where most phosphate shouldn't be adsorbed in theory. All right. Um, now, the, in the ideal world, our analysis relates directly to bioavailability. Now, and this is the sharp end of, of everything in terms of bioavailability measurement. So you have a soil test um, which can predict some biological endpoint. This example shows yield, or it could be the phosphorus concentration in the plant tissue, or it could be the total phosphorus uptake, so yield times phosphorus concentration. Um, some biological parameter that we need. Now, do we actually get this in practice? Well, actually, yes, we do. And this is why soil tests are still used, of course, because they actually do work. So here are some data uh, from somebody's somebody called Simpson's conference paper in at the Australian Society of Agronomy in, in 2003 did an experiment which involved looking at these response curves. So a couple of uh, different scenarios measuring plant available phosphorus concentration by a bicarbonate extract and looking at the changes um, or the differences in phosphorus concentration in herbage. And there's a fairly predictable relationship using this kind of uh, decreasing exponential curve um, which seems to suggest that the soil test works quite well, right? So that's good. Um, good to know. Um, aluminium toxicity. There really isn't a great test for aluminium toxicity. This would be one of the holy grails still of, of soil chemistry. There are some good kind of operational ways of looking at it, but mostly acid soils where aluminium toxicity is an issue uh, identified by pH measurements. Um, but obviously aluminium as shown by this uh, photo, which is uncredited actually, it's by Steve Carr who did his PhD here a long time ago, um, showing extreme stunting of root growth at high aluminium and, and at low aluminium in soil solution or higher pH in soil, the, the wheat plants, uh, wheat seedlings here are growing quite healthily. Um, some people have tried to have a look at this, um, there's the holy grail there, um, it, but of course this is one of the gaps in, in soil chemical knowledge. We don't really know which forms of aluminium are toxic. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, different theories about this and there seems to be you know, uh, reasonable evidence for many of the theories as well, uh, d showing how complex the situation might be. Um, so there are a whole lot of methods of course, um, but what what is shown is that, and some of the work that's been done in Western Australia is that the, the simple electrolyte extractions, the same solutions that you might measure pH in, for example, if you measure aluminium in those solutions, that's actually correlated quite well with aluminium toxicity. Although it's very complicated because you don't know whether the, um, the effect is due to the pH or the aluminium. All right. Uh, and it, it's complicated also by the fact that in many soils, although we assume that there's a, s a predictable relationship between bioavailable aluminium and pH, there isn't really. So this is an example, actually, that's not very good uh, because it's so complicated. All right. So we'll, I'll, I'll flick through that for now. There's, there is a, a graph that I can show you of some very early work uh, showing that measuring measurement of uh, aluminium concentration in solution does show the type of negative relationship with relative yield that we would expect, um, but it by no means perfect. Um, the, particularly at the, the low end of the curve, there's a bit of uh, scatter around that um, would be hard to resolve. All right, let's uh, move on to what we're going to be doing in the lab this afternoon, DDPA extraction. So DDPA is a what we call a ligand-based extraction. DDPA and, and substances like EDTA form a very strong complex with metal ions. So they're able to pull them out of 
adsorbed forms and exchangeable forms and maintain them as a, a soluble complex in solution and then we can analyse that solution. Um, but of course EDTA, it, it's not a strongly acidic reagent, it won't dissolve soil minerals so those forms of elements don't report to our analysis. Um, does it work? Well, um, here we go. The, again, uh, in this case, the vertical axes represent uptake. So it's uh, milligrams, uh, no, actually, they're not uptake, they're concentration in the plant. Milligrams of, in this case, zinc, nickel per kilogram, so parts per million of each element in the soil. Uh, and then we've got the respective element, nickel on the bottom, zinc on the top, measured by our DDPA extraction. And look, this, the statistics, uh, at least the effect size shown by the, the R value of our lines, suggests that there's some sort of predictability in that relationship, that elements extracted by DDPA are positively related to uptake by the plant. Therefore, it is a measure of bioavailability, right? Give or take. Um, now, some disclaimers to that. So th this is actually... Um, in a situation, and these data are just stuff that I could find a good picture from um, from the literature, a, a Norwegian alum shale soil, and it's effectively an acid soil, uh, and the, the DDPA test was actually calibrated for plant nutrition purposes, so dealing with trace amounts of uh, zinc and copper and uh, manganese and so forth in slightly alkaline soils. So the fact that it works in a slightly acidic soil is kind of um, suggests that the, we've got the mechanism about right. Um, and we know also that it relates um, to other elements. There's another um, another way of looking at the same data. So this is from the same article showing how the, the DDPA extractable concentration changes with soil pH. Now, does it change in the way that we would expect it to is the answer. So what we would expect is that as pH increases, we would get stronger adsorption of an element on soil surfaces and so forth. So the ability of something like DDPA to remove that element from soil solids would become less. And that certainly seems to be the case for copper uh, in both years of their experiment, right? So under acidic pH, they're able to extract more, or relatively acidic, about 5.2. Um, the extractability of copper is higher than at low pH. So that kind of makes sense too, but if we look at the zinc data, they're all over the place. There's no, uh, there's a little bit of a trend, uh, but the authors acknowledge that there's no statistical significance to that. Uh, but again, it starts to work for nickel. So does it behave according to theory? Yes and no. Um, you'll be unpicking some uh, issues like this in your particular experiment. Okay. So that we've looked at some of these already. There are some more advanced techniques for trying to estimate uh, bioavailability, the diffuse of gradients and thin films, where our analytical method, in a way, mimics the uh, something like a plant root or cell membrane. Um, works really well, but as I said, it's it's very technically challenging and expensive method to apply. Um, but here's what it looks like. These are our, we've, I've got some of these in my lab, a DGT device, uh, and basically there's a, a filter on top so that bugs don't get in and munch up this very important component of it, a diffusive gel, a very, very well-defined geometry. Now it's actually a, um, a hydrogel, so it's very, very soft, um, but we can constrain the thickness of that to within micron tolerances, um, so we can calculate the diffusion rate through that and therefore the accumulation in the layer below, which is our um, collector layer. Um, and so the concentration that we measure by DGT in a, a solution is simply related to how much we measure in the gel um, and related to the diffusive thickness, diffusive diffusion coefficient. So this is another one of these magic numbers that people have gone and measured for various ions and the time and the area of the gel. So it's a very well-defined system and it works, works really well, um, but not so well in soils because not just dependent on diffusion through the layer, it's also dependent on diffusion through um, the soil itself. So our mathematics fall down a bit. Okay, um, just a couple of words about um, some other, just really for completeness, about other aspects of soil chemistry that are important. How do we determine what type of clay is in soil? So remember when we talked about adsorption, one of the key things affecting adsorption is what 
uh, or cation exchanges, what type of clay mineral do we have? Cation exchange properties are going to be quite different if we have a clay uh, component of our soil dominated by something like kaolinite compared with vermiculite or smectite. And the way that this is done is by, again, using some of the, the nifty properties of X-rays. It so happens that the wavelength of X-rays is somewhat close to the spacing of layers of atoms in typical crystalline solids. And um, so what we can do is we can fire an X-ray at a sample and at some angles of incidence, depending on the spacing of layers, it'll bounce back so that the diffracted beams reinforce each other. So we get a peak in intensity coming out. At other angles, depending on the spacing, the, the wavelength will kind of cancel each other out. We'll get a high point corresponding with a low point, so we'll get what we call destructive interference. And so we end up with traces like this, where the bottom axis is the angle of incidence on our sample, and this is the intensity of the X-rays diffracted or reflected, if you like, from the sample. And that's very well predictable by Bragg's law. So we can actually determine D, which is the spacing inside the mineral, from the peaks of the reflection angle. Now, that's how we identify clays, because each clay, you can imagine that it's a crystal structure. It's got parallel planes of atoms at different geometries through the crystal. So each crystalline solid has a set of peaks, which are diagnostic of that element. Here's one for a pure solid. This is an illite, one of the two to one clay series. And so it's got some diagnostic peaks which we can use to identify. Now it becomes quite complicated when you've got a soil because you've got lots of overlapping peaks of, of minerals and things, but there's some pretty good software to do. And we can also sharpen up the techniques using advanced facilities. That's an aerial shot of the Australian synchrotron. So if we use X-ray um, radiation, which is very intense and which has a very, very tightly constrained wavelength, compared with the lab equipment that we've got at UWA, we can sharpen these things up quite well. Um, and look, the Australian synchrotron, believe me, it's geek paradise. If you want a very sciencey experience, get yourself some beam time there. It's crazy fun. There's an example of a, a synchrotron XRD trace um, showing the very, very sharp peaks that we get from that and, and much increased resolution. Um, the other fun things that you can do at synchrotrons are uh, uh, the types of things that are advancing soil science quite a bit. Uh, this is an example of a micro XRF um, or uh, uh, an XRF mapping. So again, the X-ray fluorescence, remember, was when we fired X-rays at the sample, it excited the atoms and they emitted X-rays of wavelengths corresponding to which atoms were present or which elements were present. And here's a map in this from this technique across a, a lateritic gravel, okay? So the, the scale across the whole thing is about eight millimeters. Um, and so we can get uh, about two micron resolution, every element in the periodic table at that resolution from an XRD spectrum on two micron pixels across there. A fantastic technique. Sample looks something like that. Uh, and so we can um, look at the internal structure of things like iron oxide gravels. Why, you might think, because it tells us something about soil properties. These things bear a history of um, the chemical conditions in the soil, and some of our work on these has provided some very, very interesting information about those sorts of processes. All right. So um, the, the objective of that work of, um, was to try and look for rare earth elements in these. And that, that spectacularly failed, but we got some nice pictures. OK, um, I think we found one spot. There's cerium here. There it is, only one. Uh, but we've got some good stuff on hand. So just to highlight some of the capabilities that UWA has itself, if you ever end up doing more research here, we've got very, very powerful electron microprobe facilities. So that here's the scale on these 10 microns across each image. And we've got an elemental map, in this case, by firing an electron beam at the sample in an electron microscope, we effectively implement X-ray fluorescence again, because the electrons will excite the atoms. When they decay back down, they'll emit X-rays. And we can measure those X-rays in a detector. So we've got elemental maps for zirconium, cerium, titanium, a whole bunch of elements. And at 
actually better resolution than we got with the Australian synchrotron. So we can do some pretty nifty stuff there too. Um, the, other, the other sorts of things that advanced techniques are uh, allowing us to do is to look at elemental speciation. So although we can't yet look at sulfur speciation on the Australian synchrotron, um, any technique that we can't do in Australia, we can get funding to go offshore for. So um, this is from Bree Morgan's PhD, where she looked in some of the sulfitic sediments in the peel and were, was able to show for the first time that organic sulfur compounds, this signal here, a small shoulder on the side of the sulfate peak, uh, were important in some of the highly sulfitic sediments, in this case in the peel estuary. The other peaks due to um, monosulfide, disulfide and elemental sulfur in those sediments as well as sulfate from the seawater environment. So there's some pretty pretty cool things that can be done. And the final thing I'd, I want to uh, just quickly put up on the screen, and we'll, we'll stop here, and uh, uh, because if you can't measure something, um, you can always try to calculate it, and that's pretty much what we'll do in our practical tomorrow morning. We're going to use speciation calculations similar to those which generated the data set that we see here um, and uh, try to simulate uh, uh, some soil in contact with the water analysis that we have and try to <coughs> back out of that what types of reactions might have been occurring. Now that what this um, article did by uh, Unsworth and some of the other people from uh, Lancaster um, did was to try this on some water samples and they actually had <coughs> measurements of iron at concentrations and used the model to predict um, in a couple of different environments. They actually use more but these are just what I'm illustrating from the, p the article. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So we can see in this particular lake water sample that they were actually <coughs> able to predict cadmium concentrations reasonably well but they were about two or three orders of magnitude out for copper. Um, nickel wasn't too bad. Lead, again, woeful. So speciation calculations don't always work. As we'll see, or we'll, we'll get a handle on tomorrow morning, a model is only as good as the data that we put in and the types of reactions that we're considering. So um, people are still working on the ideal model, I guess. And that's where I'll stop, I think.